Hi folks, welcome back to another episode of Run Yogi Diaries. This is your host Santosh Shiva. I'm so stoked to bring you the 50th episode today. And for that, we have a special guest. He has been kind of my personal running guru ever since I started recreational running about 12 years ago. Never met him, never got to speak with him, but through his books, through his YouTube videos, I learned so much about running that it's helped me tremendously throughout my journey. His running technique uses Tai Chi principles and it has helped thousands if not millions run safely, pleasurably, without much injury to themselves. He did all this at a time when the mainstream narrative about running was that it was Sufferfest, a hyper competitive sport that is not meant for everyone. He popularized the idea that running is a natural form of movement for human beings. That it can be pleasurable, it can be injury free, it can be spiritual. And if you went back to the basics, we could regain our ability to run just like we used to run when we were children. In this conversation, we explore his own personal journey in running. How did he stumble upon this idea of fusing Tai Chi with running? His notion of spirituality and how it intersects with running. The business side of creating this methodology and technique and making it mainstream. And lastly, what's next for him? Let's welcome the Danny Dreher, the co-founder of Chi Running. As always, if you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing to it. If you like this video, hit like and leave comments below in the comment section and let us know if you took something away in today's episode. Let's dig in. Hey, Danny. Hey, Sandesh. Welcome to Run Yogi Diaries. Oh, it's nice to be here. It is, uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to be speaking with you. I mean, I've been a disciple of your work uh, on Chi Running uh, for more than 10 years now. It's helped, it's helped my running. I've been running for 12 years recreationally and touch wood, not dealt with injury. And I credit that a lot with the work you've done uh, in oh, Chi Running. thank you. Yeah. So, um, so you know, we, we have a lot to talk about. We, we want to, of course, understand Danny Dare, the runner, uh, and how it all started, and uh, uh, a little bit about Chi Running, of course, but there's a lot of material out there for people to read and uh, learn about. But, um, but before that, I want to kind of hand it over to you and do, allow you to do a quick personal introduction, and then we'll jump in. Okay. So I'm Danny Dreyer. I've been... Uh... I'm trying to think when I started running. I think I started running in 1971. And so this is 50 years, I think, this year. <laughs> and Danny, uh, that's how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> that's how long I've been running. And I mean, wow. I ran some in high school, but I didn't really start running until I was 20 years old, 21, something like that. And um, But I started running when uh, – when I uh, was drafted into the military. And so I just needed something. I wasn't that into being in the military as during the Vietnam War. And so I was really not into that war or the whole scene. And so, but I was drafted. There's not much I could do about that. And so I needed something to kind of just settle me in and something I could just do for myself in the midst of pretty weird surroundings. <laughs> and so, um, so that's when I started running and I, I've, I just really loved it right away. And I, that's, I just kept doing it from then on. Uh, right now I live in Asheville, North Carolina, been here for 15 years. And uh, <clears throat> when I started Chi running, it was, I grew up in Boulder, Colorado and, uh, and then moved to the uh, San Francisco Bay area. And that's really where Chi running was started, invented and uh, everything. So uh, when I was there, um, I was in that area for like nine years and that's where it all started. It actually started in the Silicon Valley, you know, wow. um, as a lot of other things have started in the Silicon Valley. And it was a nice thing because the idea, when I had the idea to start Chi running, you know, new ideas really take hold in 
California. You know, I hate to say it, but that they are really supportive of entrepreneurism and new ideas and trying new stuff. And so it was ideal place for me to start that. And, um, you know, when I was in Boulder, that's when I started doing ultra marathon running. And, you know, my ultra marathon running was really right from the get go was really more of a spiritual practice than a physical fitness thing. And I'd been running, you know, when I started ultra running, I'd been running for 25 years already. And I'd done tons of trails growing up in Boulder. That's all I did was run in the mountains. And, uh, but then I, I ran into a spiritual teacher who actually used running as, uh, as a way to break down barriers, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, and this and, was in Colorado, this was in, in Boulder? Colorado. So if, so, you know, the whole premise is that if you really want to um, learn about yourself, run farther. You know, you find out what your limits are. You find out how deep, you know, how to dig deep if you need it. Uh, you learn how to deal with pain. You need, you know, you can experience, um, you know, incredible highs, you know, if you're doing it right. Uh, it, but there's a lot to it wrapped up in that. And so, and that all comes with uh, more mileage, you know. And so when I was doing ultras, I was I was averaging about ninety to hundred miles a week in my normal running, and then um, and I ended up running about. Let's see, I think I ended up running forty three ultra marathons. And, and, and this was uh, so. I started after nineteen. Well. Um, my first ultra marathon was in, I believe, 1991. So I didn't do ultras until I was 45 years old. And I didn't run competitively ever until I started doing ultras. And there's an interesting thing about that. And I, so I thought, well, I wanted to do ultra running. And so I also, aside from the spiritual practice, there was a thing that got me into it. And that was, I was a decent runner back then. I ran quite a bit of trails. I was strong, agile. I could do all of that stuff. But I, at 45 years old, I wasn't sure if I was ever going to be competitive, you know, be a competitive mm-hmm. runner. And so I went to the record books and I started looking at, well, you know, I can run, I can run an eight minute mile. You know, I can run 10 miles at an eight minute pace. Where would that put me nationally, you know? And so I started looking at the distances of races and the average finishing time, uh, pace per mile. And I said, so as long as I stuck with eight minutes per mile, I I was not competitive at anything until I got up to over a marathon. And then for my age group, an eight minute mile was like right in the window. So I said, well, If I could run, if, you know, I want to build up to an ultra marathon distance. If every time I add on a mile to my long run, I just add on another eight minute mile, you know, I said, well, that should, that should be able to work, you know? And so I started adding miles and uh, eventually it took me from the time I decided to do my first ultra from the time I thought about it was three and a half years. So it took me three and a half years to go from running 10 eight-minute miles to running 50 eight-minute miles. Okay. I didn't do a 50K first. I didn't do any of the. I didn't even do a marathon first. I never ran a marathon until after I was done with ultra running. It's so funny. I started with ultras. And so my, yeah, my first, uh, my first ultra marathon was 50 miles. And I did it in about six and a half hours. Wow. And so for 25 years, right, almost yeah. 71 till this point, you were running more casually, like, you know, maybe five miles, 10 miles every day. And you said, you know, you hit 100 yeah. miles, almost 92 miles a week. <clears throat> so it was more a, uh, like you said, so there's, there's some gold in what you said, right? So I want to uh, yeah. spend some time on that about the the spiritual side until you hit, you know, the competitive side. Yeah. And a lot of times, uh, you know, they are kind of, in a way, <laughs> contradict each other in, you oh, know, when, sure. when, when someone like us think about it, right? So, 
to start with on the spiritual side to talk let's spend a little bit on that in terms of what called you to that what what about it was appealing well you know i was always in for i was always into meditation i think i started doing meditation in, in 1971 also when i started running and i really liked it and i really liked the the internal stillness i felt from mm-hmm. doing meditation and but I realized something back then, and that is like in the 70s, all these gurus were coming over from India <laughs> trying to teach Westerners how to be quiet, right? How to be still. And that's a challenge on a good day, right? And so, um, and I thought about it and I thought, well, because I'd been to India and I thought, well, in India, they kind of are grounded in this kind of internal stillness. There was a lot more of it there than I ever experienced here. And so the Indians are bringing that stillness over here. Well, yeah, if if you're in a monastery, an ashram, something like that, yeah, there's plenty of it, you know. But here's Western man who is like, you know, out on the freeways doing 80 miles an hour, trying to get as many hours of work in as he can. How do you create stillness for somebody like that? And they're not going to change your lifestyle. So I thought, I like the idea of stillness. But what I was drawn to is, was really playing with how to create stillness in the midst of activity. Hmm. And that is not something that was being taught back then. It was just either activity or stillness, one or the other. Right. And, but how do, you, how do you develop that sense of stillness inside you and then bring that into your activity so that then any activity becomes a meditation because mm-hmm. you don't ever, you're working at maintaining that stillness, going back to it, remembering it, you know, working with it while you're doing all this physical stuff. Yeah. And uh, so that's what I was fascinated about. And, and that's what really drew me to do the ultra marathoning and then eventually what drew me to do in chi running. Because yeah. it's beautiful, and I think a lot of lot of us who are running will relate to what you're saying. Because um, for me, when 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 I go out and run after maybe a third or fourth uh, mile, one gets into a rhythmic, uh, you know, almost a rhythmic uh, state of being, mm-hmm. and all your thoughts have dropped off, all your worries have taken a back seat by then. And you are getting into that meditative state, and 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 you know what you say really connects here, where it resonates a lot, and yeah. uh, and you can take that developed stillness after that run, or and come back and continue with your life as usual. It could be a job, it could be yeah. uh, a profession that you're in, right? That's that's beautiful. It's a lot of yeah. gold in there. The one thing about doing a practice like this that is well, running is, for one thing, running is in your body. You can't run if you're not in your body. You know, <laughs> it's not some place you want to be. <laughs> you want to be pretty present. And that's the beauty of it is that anything that you do in your body brings you into the moment because the body doesn't live in any other time frame. It's like, yeah. talk about the here and now. One way to get absolutely into the here and now is in your body. And so running is perfect or walking or, you know, whatever brings you into your body and out of your mind so much, you know, because um, I was, in, I, I, you know, as a seeker, as a spiritual seeker, I had been through many spiritual groups, and many of them just seemed too in- heady, too intellectual and airy and like not grounded in the body. Yeah. And it, it, it just drove me crazy. You know, people would be talking kind of ethereal nonsense a lot. Yeah. And it, it, it didn't draw me. But what drew me was being able to be present. And the best way that I knew to get present was to run, go for a run. I can feel every footstep on the ground grounds me to the earth, you know. And so I'm not, I'm not uh, time-wise, I'm not in any other time frame. I'm not in the future. I'm not in the past. Uh, I, I'm just like really present with what's happening right now. Well, if that becomes your meditation, that's sti- that's what I call about stillness. Because when you get present, there's not a lot going on. You know, mm-hmm. 
you have to make moment moment decisions if you're running you have to jump over a log or you know drop off of a rock or whatever you're doing or adjust to your environment but um in order to do that you have to be present so yeah. it demands that you're present and i like that about it because no you know people avoid being present for some people, it's just too painful to deal with all that's going on. And, you know, their mind makes everything so complicated. And if you just go into the body, it's not a very complicated thing, you know, at all. Yeah. And, and, and I think in, in our modern lives, uh, I don't even know whether we have a choice because, mm-hmm. you know, you're sitting in front of a computer, uh, you know, and there's an email that comes in and boom, you know, you're parasympathetic nervous system is kicked sure. in and your <laughs> your your amygdala I've, I've read the amygdala takes over because you have a perceived threat uh it is no threat but it's some email because you you it upset you because somebody said something or the word upset you and and i don't think even we even have a choice in that matter and 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 to your to your point when when one goes out and runs in some way after about a couple of miles especially i think you slowly you you seem to that seems to lose grip on you yeah that that whole hold that your parasympathetic nervous system hopefully i'm using the right parasympathetic no, nervous the, system actually this the sympathetic nervous system. sympathetic okay sorry yeah. corrected no, that's so it, it slowly seems to let go of you and and then you feel a lot better you feel refreshed and you feel present yeah isn't it well the thing about it is is that uh, the just physiologically a lot goes on once you start running okay so you start breathing more and you know if you start if you're working too hard while you're running if you're pushing really pushing hard you know trying to i know lots of people who do crossfit and people like that that just go and they if they don't get a burn they don't feel like they got to work out right um what happens in that circumstance if the kind of people who are just kind of the uh, crazy workout people, you know, they just like to burn, um, that triggers the sympathetic nervous system because it's fight or flight because their body thinks, oh, my God, we're running so fast, we must be in danger and produces cortisol and adrenaline and all these drugs are going through your body. And that's what people call the runner's high. And it's it's literally on drugs okay Mm. so the whole idea behind chi running is to use the least amount of effort to accomplish what you need to do least amount of effort and so what that means is that every move you make you need to pay attention to make sure you're not overusing some part of your body and this is where tai chi comes in is my practice of Tai Chi. Once I started taking Tai Chi classes, oh my God, that was 1997. And um, once I started doing that, it was it totally rocked my world because in Tai Chi, you were always moving from your center. It's not so much about your mind, but it's you're moving from your center and your mind is only used to, to set up what it is you want to accomplish but then it it kind of directs your body to be, it's like your mind is the is the driver and your body is the horse and carriage you know mm-hmm. and and so if your mind can really direct your your center to move then the rest of your body goes along with it and if your center is moving now physiologically if you move from your center that's where all the biggest strongest most long lasting muscles are all your core muscles, you know. And um, if you rely too much on the peripheral muscles, that means that there's little tiny muscles doing a big job, you know. So when you think about um, learning how to relax and only use the amount of muscles you need to accomplish what you want to do, then you would almost never use the muscles in your lower legs or your feet or your toes but if you really look at the history of running, where do most injuries happen? Running injuries from the knees on down, right? So they happen, you get knee pain, runner's knee, Achilles tendon problems, calf pulls, uh, plantar fasciitis, Morton's neuroma. I could go on and on. They're all below the knee, 
Okay. And that's because people, they're in fight or flight. They're using those little tiny muscles to sprint or to push off with their toes or to like get the job done. And it's not the way to go about it. That's requiring an awful lot from a little tiny set of muscles. And in Tai Chi, it's just more, um, I always tell people Tai Chi has set up the body in a much more Marxist way <laughs> from each according to its ability. So you wouldn't ask a huge amount from a little finger, but you know, you ask, you know, the most is required from the bigger muscles as you get more peripheral, uh, you know, more distal from your center, less and less is required. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is, is if you rely more on your central part, then all those little parts can relax and actually only do the right amount that they're required of. Okay. And so um, it just makes so much sense to me when, when that hit. Yep. And that's when I transferred into my ultra running what I was learning out of Tai Chi, and all of a sudden I could run 50 miles without feeling like I had run 50 miles at all. And my legs would not be tired. I could do it in such a relaxed way. In fact, you know, you, you end up breathing when you're relaxed, you don't breathe as hard. When you don't breathe as hard, your breath actually goes deeper. And I've learned to belly breathe while I'm running, nose breathe while I'm running. All these little tiny adjustments you can do to make your body not only run more efficiently, but actually operate more efficiently, uh, more efficiently. You know what I mean? People can talk about efficient running, but they don't think of adding in their breath work to it or, you know, mental focus or all the other things that actually make your body accomplish something in a much easier way. Yeah. So G yeah. running is set up to take somebody through all of those little pieces so that eventually the idea is to run have your body running as a unified unit, you know, as a, you know, so one part isn't overworking, one part isn't taking the job of another, you know, everything is absolutely cooperating with every other part. And not only that, but the better you get at it, the more all of that unit, what comes into play is your response to the environmental requirements. If you're going up a hill, you don't run the same as you do when you're running downhill or when you're running on the flat or if it's hot out or if it's cold out or, you know, so you're constantly adjusting your, how you interact with your environment. And if you can do that, you are way more efficient than somebody who just says, oh, here's how I do it. And I'm just do that no matter what, you know? And so it becomes an art form, you know, how good can you get at reading your environment responding exactly in the right way yeah that's so beautiful that's so beautiful danny and and you know what i'm also hearing is first of all I, I didn't really connect the the nervous system and uh you know running too hard the connection um i mean for me it was more of we are working we, are, we have this life day-to-day -day life and we're constantly thrown these stimulus which you know causes us to act in a very automatic fashion, but I never really connected the the running technique itself. Also, what's um, what's beautiful is you know in what you're describing, it's coming from within. You know, it's a it's a natural it's a natural expression rather than I also see a lot of times you know you have these methods and tips where you have to go and force yourself to do something. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and then it's it's not possible because first off, I think most of us forget running after our childhood, right? And we most spend most of our adult life uh, sitting or walking or doing nothing much. But right. and then we suddenly start running, and and in what you're describing, it's almost finding one's you know natural uh, way of uh, you know movement, and and it leads to this form of running that you just described. It, it's yeah, almost, almost so natural. You know, one of the main things I try to teach people is how to listen to your body. Okay, so if this whole exercise is going to be in your body, you need to get really good at conversing with your body. It's almost like my body is something other than my mind, right? There's body-mind connection. Okay, so my body is a body and it talks. And it can tell me when I'm inefficient, 
because it feels tired. It feels <laughs> sore. If there's too much impact, I can feel it. It's telling me if my knee starts hurting, my body is talking to me saying, look, you're not moving right. And when you don't move right, something happens. So it starts as a pain. If you don't listen to it or make a correction, then that pain turns to an injury. If the, you don't listen to the injury and you try to run through the injury, the injury becomes debilitating. So then your body just goes on strike and says, you're not listening. This is our only choice, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it is really the, the one of the bottom line prime things I want to get people to do is to listen to their body and then learn how to respond to their body and instead of overriding what their body is trying to tell them. I remember being <laughs> at a marathon expo. It was in Chicago. And I was walking down the aisles in this big expo. And uh, there's a big, huge red booth, big red sign. It was for Advil, right? And the, and the sign says, when my body starts to complain, I refuse to listen. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the last thing you want to do, you know? So they, they, they want you to just pop an Advil so you don't have to listen to your body. And I'm like, I sat there with my jaw dropped, like, whoa, really? You know? So, so the whole idea is to, is to learn how to talk to your body, learn how to listen, learn how to respond with the right thing. So that's why technique is very much like a language that you learn to communicate with your body or with the environment. And I, I tell people it is, it is really like, uh, oh, it's similar to like somebody learning a foreign language, right? So when you first learn a foreign language, you just start with basic vocabulary words. You know, you got to memorize vocabulary words. So in chi running, that's just the basic parts of the, the focuses. How do you hold your hands? How do you hold your arms? How do you land on your foot? The little pieces. Those are like the vocabulary words. And then eventually as you're learning your, you know, you learn to read or you learn to converse with somebody. So you're stringing a bunch of words together and then you kind of make sense. Okay. So then, so then in a run, any given run or a race or whatever event you want to do, then you're stringing together all of these focuses. So it becomes more like talking. It's more comes like a conversational thing. It's like a physical conversation. And, and then you, you do that enough, then all of that conversation gets in you to where you don't need to think about the words every time you start talking or you start thinking in the new language. And that's when you're really getting somewhere with it. And then at some point when you can really express just about anything you want to express, then you could even write poetry in another language, learn to speak in emotions and feelings and concepts and ideas and so so with with the chi running you know you you start in stages and you start with just learning the focuses and then you string them together for a nice run so that you're efficient for 45 minutes and then eventually if you want to get into competitive running or events or anything like that you you know you learn how to interact in a way to where you're you're really communing with your environment and responding moment to moment all the time. And then there's even another step where, where it really becomes more like a dance, creative, you know, and where you can really have fun. And then, then you can let go of what you're doing and just yep. feel like uh, I feel like I'm being run. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not the runner anymore. It's these disappeared long ago. But I'm just kind of sitting back like I got this big video screen on, you know, and I'm just watching the trail go by. I'm grooving on the mountains, you know, whatever's going on. And it's not running, you know. It it is very different than what people experience as running, you know. It's, so, it's beautiful. So it's this whole you know, progression, you know, you can shoot for any part along the way, any level you want to get to. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I can speak for myself here and a uh, couple of things. One is, you know, when I started uh, chi running, uh, practicing chi running, the first thing I learned was body sensing, right? And I wasn't doing that, you know, before that. And 
uh, and body sensing was so powerful because it like you it got me present it got me uh, in touch with what was going on right now right, uh, yeah. and around me and inside me and it was so beautiful that itself was so beautiful and and it naturally propelled me to get better at it and the other thing that i hear which is again uh, gold according to me is the the mysticism around it you know like mm-hmm. when one reads one reads about running these days you have the watch you know you're looking at the time you it, it's become so technical it's become so in a way so scientific that you're breaking down everything but there is a human experience of running there is a mystery to it and it's so unique to each one of us and i feel the the whole chi running method somewhere brings a systematic approach back to that you know that whole experience rather than break it down to okay <laughs> i'm going for a tempo run or i'm going for a you know uh, uh hill repeat or i'm going for a i mean all that is good i'm not saying it's bad or wrong but there is some there's there's something more to some of the parts and that's the beauty of running and 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 that's what i'm hearing in terms of what it's described yeah and in, and also what what you're saying is that you know in terms of it chi running chi running is kind of brings it into the basic pieces of just what what good running is you know what mindful running is and uh the more you practice that the more rich every one of those parts becomes so it's like it's not just becoming a better runner you become a better person because of how you run because of the attention you pay on every step you take because of the attention you pay on taking in your environment and w- talking with your body and it's it's just a much broader spectrum of experience and just going out and watching you watch oh that's 630 miles pretty good i wonder what i can do my next one and you know, bit, you know it's like wow that is so limited, so limited, yep. you know, Absolutely. and I would much rather, and I, you know, when I'm out running, I'm, I, I love doing trails in North Carolina. We have so many trails. It's just <laughs> like endless. And, um, many runners have a hard time stopping in the middle of a run, right? It's like, that's like a sin or something like that. If I come to a place that's a really nice view or, um, crossing in front of a waterfall or I'm in a stream or just a nice forest somewhere, I'll stop. I mean, why not? Look what I would be missing if I didn't stop and just take it in. And in fact, when you're in the middle of a run, you're more likely to be able to take it in more <laughs> because you're 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 kind of worn down, you know, the the all those blocks and barriers and filters and all that stuff in your mind just gets kind of worn down and so it's the ideal time to stop take in take a breath don't worry about how fast you're going or what it's going to show up on you know uh strava or anything like that that's not something that matters and so it, it really i have no problem ever stopping during a run never I would much rather, that's part of the experience. And um, to be so many, so many people are really, like you said, run, run by the numbers. You know, I remember when I lived in, um, I lived in San Rafael, California for nine years and incredible trail running there. And they have one of the biggest running clubs in the United States. They have like 6,000 members or something. And I remember I, every year I would go to the the running club's uh, Christmas party, you know, and everybody would show up at this fancy place. It's kind of a wealthy area around there, you know. And so these people show up decked out, dressed to the nines. Everybody's body looked fabulous because they were all runners, beautiful people, the whole thing, until you walked up to them and started a conversation and all they talked about was split times, last race, da, 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 you know, how many miles you did this week? What you, what are your what race do you want to do? How many marathons have you done? And I was like, get me out of here. <laughs> you know, this is not interesting to me, <laughs> you know? And, and I had a hard time. So 
even though I was a member of the running club, I never went to their meetings or their social events or things like that because it just, that was not how I related to running, you know? Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, you know, running itself, uh, one of my favorite books uh, is uh, Born to Run, you know, and uh, where I, I took away uh, one core thing I took away from that book was how much running is such such a fundamental thing about uh, for a human being, right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of the way even our physiology is designed, in terms of uh, being able to run slow and sweat and breathe at a certain level and keep going for a long time. And so it really got me connected with running is just not an exercise. It's a fundamental way of being for human beings. Yeah. And, 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 and adding to what you're saying, it's, you know, for most of us who've lost that, it's a great way to get back in, in, in a, in a meaningful and safe way. And I feel the numbers also show, I, I mean, I feel that in, in, in running from within out, it eventually shows the numbers as well. It's not like, uh, you know, you, you, you do, you do end up getting faster, uh, at the same time, not getting injured. So it's not like that's excluded, but, uh, it, it comes from a different place. You know, that, that that's yeah. the beauty of it. It doesn't. Yeah. And a lot of people used to say, you know, chi running is, uh, kind of like lightweight running, you know, because our emphasis wasn't on speed. But the funny thing is, is that people ended up being able to run faster without pushing without driving hard, without building big muscles, without doing tons of hill intervals or wind sprints or things like that. So speed is totally in there and it's completely up to you. And what I, you know, and, and so, and that's what one, one thing people started realizing is they could run any speed they wanted to run and their level of perceived exertion did not go up significantly, did not go up like they expected it to. And, um, so it's, it is such a different approach that people get kind of thrown back of like, wow, this is way easier than I thought it would be. I should be, I should be working harder. Otherwise I don't feel like I'm getting a workout, you know, but it is, um, you end up enjoying it a lot more when you're not hurt or suffering. Or I remember talking to some guy who did CrossFit he, and he said, you know, if I'm not sore every single day, I'm, there's something I'm not doing right. And I went, if you're sore every single day, every day you're doing something wrong. <laughs> you know, why would I want to be sore every single day? I mean, you know, when you think of when you think of injuries or soreness to your muscles or things like that, usually there's only a couple of reasons why your muscles get sore. Either you're misusing them, that means using a muscle for something it wasn't intended to be used for. You're using it beyond its current conditioning. Okay. Um, and if that's the case, then it's fine to be sore maybe one day, but you don't want to be beyond your normal sense of conditioning every single time you go out to run. That's why you build and plateau and you build and plateau and build and plateau. So you know, you still have to follow those guidelines of sane training habits, you know, and, uh, and it works, you know, but the whole idea is that you just get better and better at what you do without any downside. And that's the beauty of it. There just isn't a downside, you know. And, and you've been at this chi running thing for uh, quite some time now. And, but initially, when, when you started it, right, first off, you know, you, you were a recreational runner, you were exploring this on your own, and now you come up with this method, uh, you publish a book. How, 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 did you, how did you manage to kind of um, navigate this <laughs> industry? Because, you know, there's a whole, I'm sure you had to deal with a lot of challenges there. How, how, did, you how did you do that? Oh, we got so much pushback. It was crazy. You know, when I when I first started teaching chi running classes it was 1999, right? And um, our book came out in 2004, I believe. So in 2004, I'd already been teaching for five years, and so I was kind of getting into it, getting it into a system. And then our second edition, <coughs> um, excuse me, 
came out in, I believe, 2009, five years later. And there's so many things I learned that I had to totally um, not quite rewrite the whole book, but a lot of adjustments I had to make because still, even still, chi running is a work in progress. I discover things every single week that I hadn't thought of before. I try something new and, and it works better. And so then I write it down. I send it off to the instructors. I let them know, okay, try this with your students. But um, I, you know, what happened to me is that I was an ultra runner and I was doing pretty good at it, but I was working hard at it. You know, it, it took a lot out of me to run an ultra back when I, before I did chi, chi running. And, and I always noticed that if I was doing a 50 miler, there's inevitably some guy would pass me at about 35 miles and looking fresh Looked like he just stepped onto the course, <laughs> like he cheated or something, you know? And I go, what is he doing that I'm not, you know? And almost without exception, every one of those people that passed me was falling forward. They weren't running upright. They were falling forward. And, you know, when you get tired, the first thing you do is come upright. And then you start reaching with your legs, overstriding, pushing with your rear leg, just working too hard. So the more tired you get, the more tired you make yourself, <laughs> you know. And then I then pretty soon after that occurrence, I started taking a Tai Chi class, my first Tai Chi class. And the in the instructor, all he did was the for the first couple weeks of the class would have me just stand there. He would correct, he would all the rest of the class, it was an ongoing class. So I came into the class. He says, okay, come over to the side. And he took me aside and he says, okay, I want you to work on posture. Here's what you do. You line up shoulders, hips, and ankles, do all that, stand there. Okay. The class was two hours, right? I would stand there for two hours, twice a week, just stand there. Every now and then, every 20 minutes, he'd come around, correct me, adjust a little bit, move something here, and go back to teaching the class. I did this for three weeks. And I thought, I'm paying good money for this. <laughs> Why am I just, he's just having me stand here. But then I really realized that he was creating this really nice axis of my body that, that wouldn't change if I tilted forward or anything like that. And I realized at the same time, remember I told you that I was watching people who had this forward fall. Well, I took this alignment and threw a forward fall into it. And all of a sudden, lights just started going off in my head like, oh, my God. So in Tai Chi, you keep this central axis. So that when you move, you're always moving around this central axis. And that makes you moving more fluid, and you're always engaging your core to hold this axis. You're moving from your center. So if you want to turn your body, you turn your center. If you want to swing a punch, you turn your center, and your arm goes like that, right? And so... When I applied that to my running, the very first time I did it, I went out for a five-mile run. I came back, and I literally didn't feel like I had gone for a run. In fact, I went out and ran two more miles because I couldn't – I was going – I didn't get a workout. I better go out and run. And so that clued me into like, whoa, there's something really important here. And my Tai Chi teacher would tell me that, the reason why you do Tai Chi really slowly, when you learn it, you know, you see people doing Tai Chi, they're just barely moving their body really slow. And he said, the reason why you move slowly is so that you can feel all the nuances of how your weight shifts, how you use your center, how you step, how you balance yourself once you step. You can just, it's on slow motion. So you can actually feel yourself going through the changes and adaptations of doing something different. And he says, yeah, you do that for a number of years. Then, you know, in, in, instead of Tai Chi, you know, instead of doing this really nice, graceful thing, if you speed it up, all of a sudden, you know, it's lethal. Okay. But you can't do that right off the bat or you'd be off balance. You would be using muscle. You'd be, you know, just not efficient. And then all these lights went off in my head. Like, okay, got it. So the first thing is to learn the technique and to do it slowly. So I told people when I was teaching them how to run, if they were 
some guy would come to me and say, okay, I want to run a sub three hour marathon. And I'd go, which year? <laughs> you want it this year? Forget about it. You want to do it next year? Maybe, you know? And I would have these speed demons slow down and really work at their technique in just a nice, nice, easy gear, second gear, you know, just really get the motion down to where you can perfect it at that shorter gear. And then all you do is relax and change your angle of fall, right? So if you fall more forward, the only muscles you're engaging to go faster are your core muscles, which are holding this column straight. That way you don't bend at the waist and lose power. So the more fa the faster you want to go, the more you have to engage your core muscles. But the faster you go, the more you need to relax the moving parts. Hips, ankles, knees, shoulders, arms. So it's this really interesting thing of the faster you go, the more you engage your center and the less you engage your distal parts, less. That takes a while for people to get because they think to go faster, they need to push harder. No, you just change your angle of fall. You will go faster. Gravity will pull you harder, you know? And, but that's where it gets into being this really nice, it's not just a balance, like a balance point where you're not too far forward and not too upright. You keep that balance. That's the, like the window of uh, opportunity in there. Just not too much, not too little. But it's also a balance between how much core you engage and how much distal muscle you release. There's a balance there. And so the more I, I studied this, the more I started really relating to this whole thing of throughout Tai Chi and Taoism, they always talk about yin and yang, right? And yin and yang are not opposites. They're two sides of one coin, you know? And the yang is, is a real expansive kind of energy, right? The yin is the contractive energy, but everything has both. Everything in the universe has some element of both of those. Okay, so as you fall further forward, your yin is your center. Everything's gathering to your center. But the more you gather to your center, the more you draw away energy from the outside, from the distal, peripheral parts. So that creates that to be yang. So the more yin, the more yang. And it just makes so much sense to me that you're, then you're learning about, about principles of life, you know. That's what you were fascinated about in this, you know, is that, okay, how does that transfer into life? Well, geez, you know, anything you do in your life, you can do better if you're in your body, <laughs> whether it's asking for a raise, or coming up with a business plan, having a relationship, going out on your first date with somebody, <laughs> doesn't matter. You'll have a better time if you're in your body and not in your head. And, and you can also do better throughout life if you have some kind of a relationship and a balance between output and intake, you know. And it's, so I started just seeing this running practice as just involving everything, you know, as being so your running is more like a study in how to learn about life. And that's when it really is very practical stuff about life, you know. So it's, I mean, it's been a fascinating, really fascinating trip, you know, because <laughs> like I said, I'm discovering new stuff all the time, new relationships, new, some kind of balance that I hadn't thought of before or, you know. Beautiful. And, and from a business point of view, right, uh, because, you know, you, you, you kind of pivoted this and you made this a, practice, your profession. Um, so did you have early success with some runners? How did it spread? I mean, it seemed to have caught on, became a mainstream conversation by 2009, 2010. Yeah. And so, so, so what, what, in your opinion, helped that? Is, is it because some of the initial runners you trained just went out there and they were experiencing this? Or how did, how did it happen? I would say the number one reason it happened is my wife. 
She's a masterful business person, comes from a marketing background, knows how to work with people in individually or in groups, knows how to work through businesses. She work, knows how to work with one person who is in contact with lots of people and, you know, the principle of how do you spread an idea. And um, she, she is, I mean, I am not a business person but she is the master of all of that to expand it. And she even said, when I first came up with the, the, the thing of Chi running, she said, there's a book in this. So she came from a publishing background too. So she said, there's a book in here. And I said, I can't write. Are you kidding? <laughs> and so, so she, um, she used to get a newsletter in the mail. That was back before digital newsletters she got a newsletter from a woman who was just kind of blogging about being a single parent raising a kid in new york city and and she was trying to do the right thing by him give him a good diet all this stuff but she, i loved how she wrote she wrote like she was sitting across the table drinking coffee with you you know so conversational and i said well i could do that <laughs> you know i can talk <laughs> you know and so I would just write like I would talk. And then I, then my wife read the first newsletter I wrote, and she goes, you can write. And I was a, that was the biggest surprise to me as it was to her, you know. And so, so then I, we started doing newsletters once a week. And then I would go and meet with, um, you know, team in training. I don't know if they still have that, but there is a big uh, training group all over the United States they had huge groups that would leukemia society they would get donations anyway i would back then i would just volunteer to give them a form clinic you know they would meet on sunday mornings in san francisco there'd be like a thousand people at one of these things you know so i'd take my clipboard with me and i would give a beginning talk and back then people would just give you their email address and so i just pass around this clipboard while i was doing the whole thing i'd come back and i had you know, I had I'd have hundreds of people on the list, and so that's when I then I then my wife said, "Okay, you got to write a newsletter." And so every week I wrote a newsletter, sent it out to this base, and advertised when the classes would be. If you have a friend, bring a friend, you get a discount. I mean, just all it just very organically grew. But that being said, when when we started really making headlines, um, was was really, I think the one thing that really helped launch us was there's, um, there's a magazine called Ultra Runner Magazine. And uh, they had me write, I wrote an article for Ultra Runner Magazine about, it was called The Physics of Running. And nobody ever really broke down running into physics. And I've always been fascinated by physics, how it works. And so I wrote this whole article about the physics of running in terms of how it's done through chi running and uh it got more hits than any other article they'd ever had you know and that spread us right away and when we published our book I, <laughs> this was interesting so not only did my wife really do everything to keep to initiate the business but then when we first published the book it was picked up it was um there was a book review written by the washington post some guy who was a runner just happened to read this and uh, and wrote a review about it. Well, it was picked up by, you know, hundreds of affiliate mm -hmm. newspapers all across the country. So that alone right there helped get us visible. And then the other thing that my wife insisted on was that she said, if you're going to launch this book, there's two other things you're going to need. At the, by the time that book is launched, you need to have an instructor training program in place, and you need to have um, so with the book is instructor training and uh, classes. You know, you need to be starting classes, and the instructors need to be teaching classes. And so, um, she said, you don't want this to get just taken by anybody, and they could just you know, make it big. It's what happened to spinning. The guy that invented spinning was um, didn't didn't brand his spinning, and everybody everybody their grandmother 
took it up and did their own version. And, yeah. and he lost that whole opportunity. So she was always into containing it and, you know, keeping it. And then when I did teach instructors, I, I had to come up with a way that people could replicate how I taught so that they didn't just have their own version of chi running. They had to follow very specific lessons and sequences and stuff like that. And that has worked all these years, 21 years it's been going. And the instructors are still teaching exactly the same, whether they're in the Netherlands or in South Africa or Australia, wherever they are, they teach the classes exactly the same. And that's been why it's been successful in so many ways. Beautiful. That's a lovely story. And and even the name is very smart, Chi Running. It's very catchy. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, it just grabs you. Yeah. By the name, it's like chi running. What is that? You know, even if you're People not someone said who that they walked into a bookstore and they said that that name just jumped off the shelf. You know, and yeah, yeah. So beautiful. So what's next? Yeah, I know you've. Uh, I, I read that you've retired. Uh, you know, and uh, so so what's next for you? Well, uh, what we did was last year we. Um, turned over our business to a number of our master instructors. So there was four of them that approached us that wanted to just buy the business from us and run it. And we were like, you know, my wife and I are getting older and we didn't want to be, you know, running the business forever because we did it for so long. Uh, We're just done with it, you know. And so they're taking that over now. And so we're, that's my wife. <laughs> um, so, so what we're going to do is just be, we'll still be involved um, with the chi running and chi walking. There's my wife I've been talking about. How do you do? Yes, the, the brain behind the business. <laughs> the brain behind the business. <laughs> and... Um, <clears throat> So, so I'm kind of on call, you know, if the, if the, the people running this show now need me, I can do lectures. I'm going to be talking at, uh, at a big run show in Boston coming up. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm just totally available to be a speaker and just do that kind of lightweight stuff. <laughs> and rather than teach bunches of classes, I still teach individual clients. Um, my wife and I are, <laughs> Just bought an RV, so we're thinking of going on to travel now that we don't. My daughter's gone; our dog just died last week, and so we are totally on our own. I mean, that was sad, but but she was so old that we couldn't travel, and, you know. So now, now that we can travel, we're thinking of doing a uh, you know a tour to the West Coast and back. And what we would like to do, she teaches chi walking and I teach chi running. So we'll just pick cities along the way that we never really had the opportunity to teach in because we always used to just hit big cities, Chicago, New York, you know, LA. And so on our trip, we'll just say where we're going to be teaching, where we're stopping. And that'll pop up on the website and, and uh, pay for gas. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> It'll be fun. That's nice. So that's what we're doing. and. And there's chi running, chi walking, and chi living. The chi living is what we're going to be getting into, which is what we're talking about today. You know, Beautiful. how do you take this stuff and put it into your life? How do you take it and put it into business, relationships, whatever you want to do? All the same principles really apply. But to learn the principles, you can learn them through running and walking. So get them in your body, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I mean, that was amazing um, to be uh, listening from a guru. <laughs> oh, you're a guru. Uh, you started off from a guru and now you're a guru. So that's beautiful. Yeah. That, isn't that funny? You know, back when I was, a, you know, I'm a Westerner and I would follow these gurus from India. And then it was so funny it was in 2019, I think, when I went to India, they were calling me a guru. And I was like, no, wait a minute, you got this wrong. I'm not a guru. And they go, you are a guru. And they would, you know, it was so funny how it, how it flipped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guru is uh, basically a teacher, so teacher. Uh, an enlightened teacher. So no, you're one. So that's And I, one thing I will say is I love teaching. I, I, that's what lights my 
day up, you know, whenever I get to teach. So talking with you and your audience uh, is stuff I love to do. I have endless energy for that. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Um, you know, that's a beautiful conversation. Uh, I want to move to the last part of our um, uh, conversation here, which is a fun Q&A round. Um, I used to call it rapid fire, but it never is so rapid. So I'm just calling it fun You'd Q&A call round. You call it a pop quiz. <laughs> pop quiz. It's about yourself. <laughs> cool. You ready for that? Sure. Hit. All right. Uh, here we go. So the first thing I have for you, is what's the worst thing of being a pioneer? Oh, uh, worst thing a pioneer is that uh, you get to learn everything the hard way <laughs> rather than from somebody else, you know, who's already done it. You know, there's no new tracks in the snow. <laughs> you know, there's, there's nobody who's tromped it before you. So it, it does take some navigation skills <laughs> and, and you get good at learning from mistakes. Yeah. That's the worst. The best part is that you learn from your mistakes. The worst part is making the mistakes. I mean, I mean, you know, it's just. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Beautiful. What's your favorite junk food? Favorite junk food? Trader Joe's. <laughs> vanilla meringues. They're great. <laughs> oh, these are those one calorie ones. Yeah. These are like almost nothing. They're fat free. And they're they're like this this whole thing is like twenty two calories. It's ridiculous. It's like pop it in your mouth, done. They're fun. They melt, you know. So that so or the junkiest yeah. of the foods you eat yeah, is still about, very healthy. That's still pretty healthy. Yeah, I, I don't eat a lot of junk food, but uh, I, if it is going to be tending towards junk, I want it to be healthy junk. You know, <laughs> <laughs> makes total sense. So, um, a place that you want to travel once the pandemic ends? Oh, I would like to, um, well, I wanted to go back to Europe. I love, we have so many people, teachers and, and people over there that would just love us to come and do a tour of Europe. So that would be really nice. And, um, you know, I was in India. I would love to go back to India. I loved that place. It was so cool. And um, so that's another place I would go. But there's places I haven't been yet. You know, I've never been to New Zealand, Australia area. Mm. And uh, never been to some of the countries in Central and South America, Colombia, Ecuador, places like that. Yeah. So we've got to get the chi running. I mean, I've uh, been able to travel an amazing there. number of places teaching running. You know, it's been really fun. That's that's the best part of it, you know. But there are some places I haven't been yet. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Beautiful. All right. This is something I might probably know what your answer is, but let me ask anyway. We'll um, see how close you are. <laughs> the ocean or the mountains? Mountains. <laughs> I thought you would say that because <laughs> you live there. <laughs> Although, although I love sailing. And, uh, and so, you know, even when I was in Boulder, I had a little sailboat, a laser, a little tiny sailboat. And I loved sailing just because it's quiet and it relies on your skill, your relationship to the wind, how you read it, how you play it. I don't, I've never done like big sailboats, but I love little sailboats, little fast sailboats. <laughs> awesome. Terrific. But give me a mountain. Last one, which is my favorite. Sorry? Give me a mountain and I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think my guess was right there. <laughs> but I just right. wanted to take a chance if <laughs> my guess was right. All right. The last one is uh, a favorite question of mine that I ask all my guests is, if a movie were made of you, A, what genre would you put them put it in? And second, who would you like to play you? Okay. So what, what genre would it be? Oh, gosh. A movie about me. It would be probably. Um, I w- I would like it the genre to be kind of a spiritual inquiry mm. Mm. genre, you know. And uh, who would play me? God. Um. 
probably Daniel Day Lewis because he can play anybody. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know who, uh, but that that would be a good guess. That'd be kind of interesting to see how somebody could imitate me. <laughs> I would pick, you know, Keanu Reeves. Oh yeah, kind of. Yeah, you he's have a got bit of that mind there. vibe about the same. He's he's good that way. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Awesome. So that was uh, great. You did well in the Q&A round. That was fun. <laughs> I passed. <laughs> you passed. You passed in flying colors. <laughs> beautiful. Uh, this was such a beautiful, profound conversation, uh, Danny. And uh, uh, we're kind of coming to an end of our uh, conversation here. Any Anything that you want to say before we wrap up? Any, well, any one, message? One thing I would say is that um, all day long, every day, there are so many life lessons available to everybody, whether it's good, bad, feels weird, awkward, great, whatever it is. And I think the biggest mistake a lot of people make is not to learn from all of those. Learn something. Learn something. Because, you know, that's how you evolve and develop as a person. And and if you miss too many of those, you just kind of like mumble along, you know, the same, the same. But if you take advantage of all those little lessons that surprise you or come at you, and something might be in a lesson that you might not even look at it as a lesson, but if you look closely enough, it certainly is. And so um, yeah. I would say the biggest thing to watch for are those lessons and to take advantage of every single one while you got the time. You know, I mean, because the one thing that it does is it affects your quality of life directly. You, if you make the right decision to, to learn a lesson and to move in a new way from then on, uh, you can really affect your quality of life. And instead of your quality of life, as you get older, you just kind of like drift downhill. Your quality of life just gets better and better and better and you know and why not i mean that's yep. <laughs> yeah totally and coming from a master that that's a great advice thank you yeah all right danny i'm um, uh thank you so much uh for for the time here uh and and you know your uh wisdom your experience you've lived a uh you know you've you really made a difference uh to a lot of us uh runners and um uh, the the uh, the quality of life element is uh, is so so powerful. Yeah. It's just not about physical movement, but it's also something more than that. So you really, you know, your contribution is so so. Uh, we thank you, thank you for that. Well, I want to, I want also, I want to thank you, and and uh, I always appreciate being asked good questions because I always, fe- I've always said that I give a better interview if I get better questions. And, and so I give you credit for studying the material, for n- knowing what you're after, and for pursuing what you love, you know, and, and those questions were great. And it brings out a lot more for me. I mean, there's a lot of interviews you could just say, so how many miles a week do you run? So, you know, it's like, no, nah, no, nah, let's go somewhere else. <laughs> you know? Thank you. So thank Appreciate you that. for that. Thank you. All right. Mm-hmm.